I think I'm going to turn each one of these games into a sort of design challenge. So what I love about World Killer are all the different unit types. I just like how all the unit types interact with each other. I like the different actions that you can perform. I like the stretching, the jumping, the popping. I like the way damage works. Like basically, I love the rule set. There's just a lot of arithmetic that has to happen um, many, many times each turn, every single turn. So I was thinking I would use, I would build some sort of dial, maybe even like 3D print them. And then I was, I was like kind of rough prototyping these little standees uh, that the ships could sit on top of. And then, uh, and then I was like, well, I could build the dial into the standee. So it basically eliminates all the bookkeeping. Each ship would have one of these little printouts that you'd stick on here. I hop into my, a 3D modeling app. Now I use Lightwave just because that's the program I've been using for, for decades now. Uh, but you know, I think you could use Blender. Blender's free. It's just a series of discs. You can just draw out a disc. This is just an example of how I did it. You create the disc and then you, you can select that top edge and then you can just bevel it. Beveling is, is really powerful. And that's essentially how I designed my standy. And then if you want to create the little sprockets, you just select all those faces and then, uh, and then you just bevel those and you bevel them outward just the right amount. So we're going to delete that, but if you know, you spend like an hour on it and this is what you end up with. And then I did the same thing with the ring, the little slider ring, just a disc with a hole in the middle. And then I just, I just knifed out like one section of it. And then I just did the opposite bevel. So you get these nice little catches as you turn the ring and it kind of locks into place. And then when you're done modeling, all you do is export your model as an STL file. And it's just a simple export option. Now I have a really cheap, really, really cheap, really simple 3D printer. Uh, it's called Cetus 3D and it uses um, a slicer from Tier Time called Up Studio, and this is what the slicer looks like. Slicer is just a software application that allows you to uh, bring in models. I just loaded in my STL file for the standee base, and so now it's in my slicer, and it's pretty much ready to print. Like this, this box here represents the the three-dimensional volume on my actual printer. So then we go to the printer, and and this is it. It's uh, it's really. I mean, this is the size of my hand, so you can see this. The print bed is only like a six inch, is only a six inch square. And the first thing we do is uh, we just turn this printer on, and the printer is connected to my laptop via a USB cable, which allows it to communicate with the slicer. And the first thing you do with this particular printer is uh, you initialize it. So there's just a little reset button here and you hold it until you hear a sound. So then it just goes through this a little initialization process. So now the printer's initialized. And like I said, this, this printer is super lo-fi. I mean, the, the, the spool just goes on this freestanding spool holder. And then the other end of this filament is going to go down into the extruder motor. So I keep this feed tube detached and I sort of push down on that feeder motor. Now the printer beeps when it was ready to extrude and I just apply a little bit of force just to make sure that the extruder motor has caught the, the filament. Now I had some orange filament in there earlier so you, you can see it's extruding filament now and all the orange filament that I had in there before is now getting squeezed out and it's slowly getting replaced with black filament and then now it's done it just extrudes for like 10 seconds so now we're loaded our nozzles warm I put this feed tube I connect the feed tube into the motor and so now we have black filament loaded coming through the feed tube down into the extruder motor so then we just come back to our model and uh, we just go here to the print menu and then there's all kinds of different print options 
you can go super high quality, you can do lots of infill, uh, you can do very little infill, fast quality. For all this stuff, I'm just doing the cheapest, sloppiest infill with the fastest quality. So that's why, I mean, these prints aren't going to be amazing. I do layer thickness of 0.2 millimeters. That's like pretty generic standard. I basically am just using generic settings for all this. And so now I just click print. And the slicer software is sending the model to the printer right now. And here it's telling me that this is going to use four grams of filament and it's going to take 15 minutes to print. So then I click OK. So now it does a little bit of extruding before it starts printing. I usually pull that little bit of thread out of there. The first thing the printer does is just throw down a little test strip. That's just sort of, sort of how it cleans, cleans itself before it starts. Now the second thing the printer is going to do, it's going to build a little raft. It's going to build this like little foundation of filament upon which to print the actual object because it kind of helps the object adhere to the print bed better and it just sort of gives the object a stable base. So like the slicer said, um, this this is about four grams of material. Now that spool is, that's a thousand grams of filament and it costs about 20 bucks. The biggest downside to 3D printing is the speed. Um, I, I feel like the cost has come way down. The printers are cheap, the filament's cheap, uh, the quality is getting better and better. I mean, if I printed this stuff on high quality with my best print nozzle, um, the results are really good. The quality of these printers is just getting better and better and better, but uh, but they're slow, you know? I mean, the reason I print on fast with just a little bit of infill and a larger nozzle is because if I, if I cranked all the quality settings of this printer up and put the highest quality nozzle on, um, the prints would just take forever. The printer's just doing its thing. Oh, and here we go, it just finished. So once it's done, all you gotta do to get it off the print bed, I just have this, this actually came with my printer. You just stick these under here and just lightly, very lightly, it just pops right off. It's super easy. I just sort of, I just go around the base and just kind of, just do some really light peeling away. And usually by the time you get all the way around, it just starts to peel right off. And there you have it. So this is the final, looks like there's a little bit of crud over here. So I just go in and clip that off. So there's a final, a final base. The ship design is just as easy as the, um, as the standee design really. I mean, all I'm doing is basically creating a sphere and then beveling some of the polys inward or outward to create some texture. And, and then I just created, a, then I just modeled the disc and then I just sort of uh, welded the sphere and the disc together. But an example of how you can build this stuff really quickly is, uh, you know, you just create a sphere. And then if you want to create, if you want to do some detail work, you can just select like a band from the sphere. And there's two tools really that are, that are kind of the secret to this whole process. Uh, one, one tool is the smooth shift, which will take a whole band of these polys and smooth shift them either in or out. So in this particular example, uh, you know, I've created this like detail for this ship. And then the other tool that's amazing is the bevel tool and you can just sort of bevel these polys out like this. And then you've got some like interesting texture for your alien ship. And that's all I'm really doing to build ships. And now I'm just working on the dial sticker. And I basically just created, these are all individual text fields and I just rotated them. There's probably a much more sophisticated way to come up with this, but I literally just manually hammered it out. And then 
afterwards I went ahead and just printed out like a whole sheet of Dominator and World Killer stat dials because I'm probably going to screw some of them up when I try to cut them out and stick them on and then I'll just print this out on sticker paper. And I have no idea if this is going to work. I don't have any idea if any of this is ever going to work. I just start trying stuff and I just kind of hope that um, I just kind of hope that it ends up working. Oftentimes it doesn't, and then I have to kind of just go back and try something else. See if I can approach a problem from a different angle. So with each one of these that I cut, I get a little better and learn a few more tricks. Holding the X-Acto knife in a way that's uh, not perpendicular to the sticker paper keeps it from tearing as much. And then I sort of gently lay the sticker paper down uh, until I get this sort of like lined up where it's going to snap in. And then I press. And then I, I, I pull the dial back off. And then I burnish. I burnish the sticker with my finger like vigorously for several revolutions, you really want this sticker to adhere. Then I just snap the cover back on. And um, this actually, let's see, this is a world killer. So at zero points of damage, it's going to have a defense strength of six and an attack strength of three. And then I just put the ship back on its standy. So I've completed my invading forces. I've got the two Dominator ships. I've got the five world killers. And I've got the stat dials for each one built into the standee. But the next thing I need to do is build a map. Now, back when I was playing world killer, I used this map to give each column of cubes its own place for the counter. Now, I think I'm going to go with a hex map and do away with the 3D space altogether. But I think I think before I build the defending forces, I'm gonna work out some sort of map. This is roughly what I'm thinking for the map. This is actually, this. so this would be an 11 by 17 sheet of paper. And this is half of the map, so I'd print two of these out. And I think the home planet is gonna be kind of in the middle of the map. And I was thinking about having these orbital paths around the planet for like a moon that sort of advances with each turn. But I'm not really sure. I kind of want to just keep moving the ball forward. And I like just kind of working out all this stuff on the fly as I go. I'll probably go ahead and print out this map, even though it's a little premature to do so, because I want to just kind of keep the juices flowing and keep iterating on the process. In the long run, it costs me a little more in ink, but I feel like having hands-on testing and tinkering with materials in real time is helpful. It's beneficial to me. Now I need to model and build the uh, defending forces and maybe model a planet and maybe a couple moons. So I've iterated on the map. I decided to keep the planet in the middle of the map. And I like the idea that the intruders can come from any one of the four corners. And for the first design, I decided to tackle the Orbital Fortress. And first I came up with this Stanford Taurus design. It's kind of a classic. I assume that both these civilizations have mastered gravity and they don't really need to simulate it with rotational velocity. So for my second version of the Orbital Fortress, I decided to keep it more in line with the original artwork. Now I'm only spending about 10 minutes on each one of these ship designs. The scale of these ships is so small, it's not really worth putting like an enormous amount of detail into them because even with this, with this fairly crude low poly amount of detail, by the time you print it out at scale, you know, this ship is just maybe a little more than a centimeter. It's using less than one gram of filament. So with a roll of filament, I could print over a thousand of these little ships. So it's, it's a minuscule amount. Of material involved. While I'm printing out one batch of ships, I'll design the other. So I kind of have an assembly line. So this project might seem like it's taking an enormous amount of time and resources, but 
I'm printing one ship while I'm modeling the next, and then by the time the V dusters are done, I'll have the space train reserve cruisers modeled, and I just kind of keep going. Now for the K wagon, I basically just took the V duster, cut off the back end of it, built this little like secondary hull. Maybe it's an engine, who knows? This is definitely the point in the project where I start to wonder if I'm crazy <laughs> building all this stuff. And uh, yeah, you gotta, you gotta embrace the crazy. You be like, fuck yeah, I am crazy. So I think I'm gonna go ahead and shoot a playthrough. So turn one, move one, the Dominator is gonna go for the uh, space train. So the Dominator has uh, an attack strength of four. The space train has a defense strength of four. So there's no defense modifier. So we just roll and there's an adjacency bonus to defense. So uh, his four defense is gonna be bumped up to a five. So we're gonna subtract one from our die roll here. So four, uh, the space train is taking four damage. So we just rotate the damage dial here, four damage. Now the space train's uh, defense is down to uh, two now and he can no longer attack. And then the dominator, I just flipped um, this little indicator here from left to right to indicate that the Dominator has used up its turn. I think the space train is gonna stay where it is and repair because uh, this V Duster will get an adjacency bonus on its defense as long as the space train hangs out there. It may be a mistake. Uh, they, both, they both may end up being destroyed this round, but we'll see what happens. So on a repair, uh, you get to recover as many damage points as your current defense. So the defense is two, and so he recovers two damage points. So that brings his damage down to two, his defense up to three, and now his attack is back to four. And then his turn is over, so we, we flip his switch. Uh, world Killer is going to attack the space train. So three minus one is two. So this World Killer does two damage to the space train. So it takes it from a two um, back up to a four. It can no longer attack. Basically, the V-Duster is no match for the World Killer. They probably should have gotten out of there, but let's subtract. Let's try it. We're going to subtract two. Six minus two is four, so we have to subtract four from our roll. <laughs> so yeah, the V-Duster uh, did zero damage. So this World Killer has a weapon range of three, so he can attack the space train. He does three damage. So now the space train uh, has seven damage and everything's gone red here, which means that this is his, basically his last point of damage before the space train is destroyed. This world killer is going to fire on the space train. He's got an attack strength of three. He's down to a defense strength of one, so there's no defense modifier. He only does one point of damage but that destroys the space train. I'm just doing cluster at a time because none of the other ships could actually reach this in time. So I'm just playing out each one of these clusters. So this V duster takes four damage. This space train is going for this world killer. So he has an attack strength of four, defense strength of six. So we subtract two from our die roll. So two points of damage to the world killer and the space train has used his turn. And now this world killer is, I think, going to return the favor. Uh, attack strength three, the space train has a defense of four plus one adjacency bonus, so that's five. So we're gonna subtract two from our roll. The world killer actually does no damage. This V duster can fire on this dominator uh, he has a attack strength of two. The dominator has a defense of four. So we're gonna subtract two from the roll. Uh, he does zero damage. The dominator is going for this, is going for the space train. Uh, space train has a defense of four plus one adjacency. That's five. So we subtract one. So two damage to the space train. 
I think this V Duster is actually going to jump to and attack. He's going to do a pop attack. Uh, so he has an attack of two uh, versus the world killer's defense of five. I forgot these world killers have huge defense. Hmm. So we have to subtract three from our roll. Uh, so he only does one damage to the world killer. But he takes two damage because of his pop attack. So now he can no longer attack. And then for the end of turn one, uh, I'm basically just going to be moving all of these ships, uh, their maximum uh, jump range, just to get closer to the action. Because right now they're like way on the other side. Uh, so jump range of two, a jump range of two, um, jump range of three. And then up here we've got jump range um, two, two, three. And then the last thing we do, this is, uh, this is a special rule that I created specifically for my version of World Killer. At the end of the turn, you rotate the orbital fortresses one hex clockwise along the orbital path of the planet. And that's the end of turn one. And uh, we go from turn one here to uh, turn two. Now we should have been toggling these little switches to the right. Now on, this, now on turn two, as we move our units, we're gonna be toggling that switch back to the left. Yeah, so the V-Duster was just, just destroyed by this world killer. I think these, uh, the Dominator has gone and this world killer is gone. These other three world killers are gonna stretch. So I'm gonna set the dial uh, to uh, 90 degrees from the, from the bottom label of the ships. And so all three of these ships are just uh, stretching. So we're gonna go one, two, jump range two jump range, one, two, three, and uh, we'll just toggle one, two, three, and then we do our, our orbital rotations on the fortresses, and we move our turn counter, the moon, up one. All, this whole cluster of ships is gonna stretch, so this world killer is on its second turn of stretching. Uh, this world killer is on his second turn. This world killer is on his second turn. And this world killer is on its first turn. Uh, this battle is kind of in a weird stalemate situation over here. The V-Dusters keep taking damage, but then they just keep repairing their damage. Um, and then we have like the other, the rest of the fleet continuing to move across and and move into a defensive formation around the planet. So this was a big turn. This whole cluster of uh, intruder assault ships jumped here and there was a huge battle ensued. All the world killers took some damage and a couple of the planetary ships were lost. And then down here, this battle continues. Uh, it's kind of a slow attrition situation over here and then we've got these these ships are still uh, racing to the scene to try to take out this dominator and the k-wagon broke off from this group and is heading toward this world killer who's trying to escape so there's a lot of activity going on on the board right now this battle continues planetary defenders basically got this uh, dominator pinned down over here and uh, there's a world killer that's kind of going rogue over there. And we still have some intruders coming in from this direction. And we've got a few planetary defenders along with the orbital fortresses holding down the fort around the planet. And there we have it. I think it's like turn uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. On turn eight, one of the world killers did a pop attack. Um, on the planet and was able to knock out the last of the defense shield. I think it works pretty well. Uh, it's really nice sort of having all the bookkeeping and all the uh, effective defense updating done uh, for me. Um, it's just, it's a lot easier to kind of get immersed in the game if I'm not constantly re-crunching all the numbers.
dozens of times every turn. So I would say all in all, this is a fairly successful experiment. I want to do a little more play testing and kind of see like how it holds up over several sessions. But and I also also want to um, also want to set up a game with the optional units and the reinforcements.